I want to tell you about a new podcast called Amuse News. Publishing multiple days a week, Amuse News is your source for food news, interviews from around the food world, and more. On the show, we'll be engaging with food storytellers, from chefs to advocates to people working in the field, and many more. Find Amuse News wherever you get your podcasts. Amuse News is a destination for everyone who's looking for a new, insightful look into the world of food. Today's program was brought to you by EscapeMaker.com. Visit a farm. Escape through the net. Visit EscapeMaker.com for more. This is Michael Harlan Turkel, host of The Food Scene. You're listening to Heritage Radio Network, broadcasting live from Bushwick, Brooklyn. If you like this program, visit HeritageRadioNetwork.org for thousands more. All right. All right. Thank you so much for tuning in to the Heritage Radio Network. We are coming to you, as always, from the back of Roberta's Pizza here in Bushwick, Brooklyn. And you're listening to The Farm Report. I'm your host, Darren Fairbanks. Every week on air, I get down with the movers and shakers in the farm to table sphere. Um, Off air, I am the executive director of the Heritage Radio Network. And we've got a jam-packed show for you, uh, something a little different today. Um, we're going to start things off, though, with a little segment from our friends at Escape Maker, escapemaker.com. Today, they are taking us, um, introducing us, if you will, to the great folks down at Added Value. Added Value Farm is located right here in Brooklyn in the neighborhood of Red Hook, and we are on the line with some of their team, Corey Blant and Nellie Burgos. Welcome to uh, the show, guys. Hello. Hi, Aaron. Nellie, did I pronounce your last name right? Yes, you did. Whew, that is a relief. I was feeling a little nervous. <laughs> um, yeah. Well, guys, for folks who are not familiar with Added Value, Corey, maybe you could tell us a little bit about who you guys are and what kind of work you do. Sure. Uh, so we are a nonprofit organization, Added Value, and we have two farms that we operate in Red Hook, Brooklyn, like you said. Uh, we have the Red Hook Community Farm, which is our large flagship production site. It's located across the street from Ikea. It's three and a quarter acres. And we have the NYCHA Red Hook Houses Farm, which is just a few blocks down the street, across the street from the Red Hook branch of the Brooklyn Public Library. And the idea behind both of the farms is that they are a vehicle to educate and empower and train young people from the neighborhood and from South Brooklyn in general about so many things related to sustainable agriculture, related to leadership within our communities, and to really help them to be ready and prepared and feel like they can be successful in whatever is to come. So we work primarily with high school students, but we also have elementary school students who are on the farm, and we have some out-of-school youth ages 18 to 24 who help out as well. Nellie is one of those wonderful people, so... She awesome. can tell you even more about what they're doing. Cool. Yeah. Well, Nelly, why don't you um, share a little bit about yourself? Um, how, what what year are you in school, and how did you get involved with the farm? Yeah. So I am 15 years old, and I'm in. I'm a sophomore, so 10th grade, and I got involved. I wanted to, you know, start getting involved in working. I've been like bored at home and whatever and with school, and I wanted to do something else with all my free time. And I saw the flyers on my building, and it was really convenient because the farm is like a block or so away from my house. So I got an application, and I signed up and applied, and I got the job. And I really love it at the farm. Oh, well, kudos to you. Well, um, I know we always like looking to our friends at escapemaker.com to help direct us towards fun kind of farm experiences. And so maybe you can give us a sense, Nellie, if folks um, come on down for one of your uh, open volunteer days, um, what are some of the activities that they might expect to partake in? So volunteer days are on Fridays and Saturdays. On Fridays, I think it's from... 10 to, what is it, Corey, 10 to? 9 to 12 on Fridays and 10.30 yeah. to 1 on Saturdays. Awesome. And people can yes. just show up, right? No RSVPs necessary? 
some some I'm not pretty sure of how the volunteers come, but I know I just know that they come to the farm and they do different things like um, composting, which is like the process of, process of making our soil. And so they would help out with different things like making a windrow, which is like um, it's like a pyramid shape. Um, a pair, it's like a pile of mixed greens and browns, and that's it. We let it sit there to decompose, and then that's how we get our soil. They come in and help with that. Like some of them do the shoveling, others do different things from like sifting, which is they separate the soil from the wood chips, and they're also allowed to go on the beds and help out with like planting or weeding, things like that. Awesome. And so, Corey, if people want to take home some of the stuff that you grow, uh, tell us a little bit about your farmer's markets. And um, I heard there might be some CSA slots left, so give us the details on that, too. Sure. So the farmer's market happens on Saturdays, and it runs from June to November. Our opening day will be June 20th. It's sure to be a fun time, so everyone is encouraged to come on down. It happens on the farm itself. So on the Red Hook Community Farm, which means not only do you have the opportunity to purchase our wonderful, fresh, locally grown produce, but you can also see where it's grown and hang out, walk around, enjoy the farm itself, which is really nice. And the CSA distribution also happens on Saturdays. Uh, CSA is open to folk from the neighborhood and from Brooklyn in general. There are a few more slots left, so if anyone is interested, they should contact the coordinating group, which is at redhookbkcsa at gmail.com. And, yeah, the CSA runs the same season as the farmer's market. It's from June 20th until November 21st, and there are lots and lots of tomatoes, more tomatoes than you would know what to do with. So nobody, nobody can be disappointed in that. Oh, man, that sounds <laughs> awesome. So um, just a couple more minutes here. But, uh, Nellie, I'm wondering, you know, your time on the farm, can you share with us maybe a little story about um, something that really surprised you when you started working on the farm, like a moment where you're like, oh, man, I didn't know that happened like that, or, or something that was a surprise to you as you got, you know, more versed in, in the growing process? Um, so I came in around the summertime, um, when I first started working, which was around the time where every, all the plants had already, like, started growing. So I didn't really get to see, like, the, the progress it makes when it starts growing, but now we're in the springtime and I'm here. So it really, like, it really got me when I started seeing, because now the things are starting to come up on our, our farm and things are growing, like, really fast. And that shocked me a little. Yeah, that's uh, I, I, I definitely feel you there. It's like things just shoot up right overnight, it feels like sometimes. <laughs> yeah. And then, um, Corey, maybe um, just kind of some, some final words on, um, you know, I'm curious when students um, um, and volunteers kind of leave the farm, what are some of the things that they feel have been like the most impactful takeaways? What are the things that people are like following up with you to say, hey, man, that was so awesome because... I think the the coolest thing about both of the farms, the Red Hook Community Farm and the NYCHA Red Hook Houses Farm, and what added value is doing in general is that people are able to participate in the process of growing food. And I work a lot with the elementary school students as well. And so you'll get first graders who come to the farm and really think that vegetables grow on supermarket shelves. Yeah. And when you are able to participate in that process, spend an hour or two on your Friday or Saturday and see what's going on and see how if you are shoveling this kind of smelly compost, eventually it will turn into what we so lovingly call our black gold that can go up onto the beds and really enrich the soil and allow us to grow these big, beautiful brandywine tomatoes. You get to see the full circle the full cycle and participate in that and know that you're growing food that's going to be going out into your local community and that's you know i think that's really special and really awesome for a lot of people who are involved 
Awesome. That's how I feel. All right. <laughs> you guys are making me want to head on down. I haven't been over to the farm probably in the last like two years. It's been a while. So I'm definitely due for a visit this summer. I will come out and see you. Corey, Nelly, thank you so much for joining us. It was great to get a little insight into what you got going on down at the farms. Thank you. Awesome. Thank you, Aaron. For folks who want to learn more about Added Value, check their website, www.added-value.org. And if you want to find out more about great kind of weekend adventures and trips like this, definitely check our friends at escapemaker.com. Now, something a little different, something a little fun for this week's show. Um, I would really love to take this opportunity to introduce you to one of my favorite shows on the Heritage Radio Network. It is called Inside School Food. It is hosted every week by the amazing Laura Stanley. Laura takes you through um, the ins and outs of the federal school lunch program, looking across the country at what's working, what's not working, um, what we should be doing more of, often what we should be doing less of. And I wanted to use uh, today's time slot to introduce you to her, and we are going to play uh, her most recent episode. It's her 39th show entitled Locavore Mayor Takes on Lunch. Um, Definitely sit tight. You guys are super, super lucky to get a chance to uh, enjoy this program that Laura put together. She interviews the Portland um, Maine mayor, Michael Brennan, um, who talks a lot about that city's commitment to supporting local farmers. And then also Ron Adams, who is the school district's food service director. Some really amazing kind of farm to table and um, school lunch innovation happening in Maine. This is a great show to check out on a weekly basis. You can subscribe to it via iTunes or find it on our website, just like the Farm Report. So without further ado, I'm going to give you Laura. Visit a farm. Log on to escapemaker.com for more ideas on local weekend getaways and day trips, including orchards, farms, and wineries. Or come by Escape Maker's Yellow Tent in Grow NYC's Green Markets and pick up a guide to local agritourism escapes to the Green Market's own farmers and producers. The guide will be updated seasonally to feature farms, wineries, and destinations in New York City, New York State, New Jersey, Vermont, and Pennsylvania. Plus, Escape Maker will offer overnight packages to these destinations so you can get the full experience. No car? No problem. Escape Maker features plenty of ideas for car-free getaways, including discounts via Amtrak. There's no better time to explore outside the city. Soak up the fresh air and scenery like a butterfly and support your local farmer. Log on to escapemaker.com to get inspired and make your escape through the net. Good morning and welcome to Inside School Food on the Heritage Radio Network, where people working inside school food come together to talk shop about issues that really matter and solutions that work. I am Laura Stanley. Um, if, If you're a regular listener, you know that we talk a lot about the great work going on in school food in Portland. That's Portland, Oregon. Today, we're going to visit with the much smaller city of Portland, Maine, Um, And Portland, Maine is the namesake for Portland, Oregon, which is a very fun factoid given how much the two cities share culture-wise. Portland, Maine consistently rates near the top in those listicles published in national magazines. Um, It rates high for being exceptionally hip, educated, livable, cozy, family-friendly, startup-friendly, locavore, and seriously, I mean seriously, foodie. Um, The city is a magnet for some of the most talented chefs in the nation, and it supposedly leads the nation in restaurants and bars per capita. So given all this, it's not surprising that the school district is pursuing an ambitious agenda in its cafeterias. So we're going to hear a lot about that today, and we're going to hear about an interesting piece of the Portland school food story that really sets it apart. Um, They are aiming to move their food purchasing to 50% local by the end of 2016. 
Um, and as far as I know, this is unheard of in school food. Uh, anyone out there who knows different, please correct me if I'm wrong. And, and wait, it gets better. The pressure to get this done, along with some of the logistical and much of the political support, is coming from City Hall. And, and that's pretty unusual, too. So with us today to talk about it is Portland Mayor Michael Brennan, who campaigned on this Locavore goal, not just for the public schools, but all the city's institutional food purchasers. He's the first mayor to appear on Inside School Food. Um, I'm going to ask Mayor Brennan about how this initiative is integrated with his overall goals of food security for a city of more than 200,000 people in a region with a very short growing season. Um, after station break, we'll be speaking with Ron Adams, who is director of Portland Public Schools, um, uh, director of nutrition, sorry, for Portland Public Schools. And, and Ron is going to tell it like it is. His is not an easy job. He's clearly a guy who relishes a challenge. Um, so, Mayor Brennan, welcome so much to, to Inside School Food. We're so thrilled you could join us today. Well, Laura, thank you very much for having me, and thank you for the very uh, kind introduction. Um, and uh, we obviously are very proud of some of the things we're doing in the city mm-hmm. of Portland. Good. Well, let's talk about them then. I, uh, first, I should introduce you. Um, I, I could easily use up the next five minutes describing your career history, and that would be talking fast. Um, you're a well-known figure in the main political scene, um, having served for many years in the State House of Representatives and the State Senate. Um, where you served as Dem- uh, Democratic Majority Leader. But what I think is especially interesting, given what we're about to talk about, is your background as a licensed clinical social worker mm-hmm. and your many years with the Muskie School of Public Service mm-hmm. at University of Southern Maine. You know, you've been working on child welfare in a public policy context for a long time, so your deep interest in school food ties into a lifetime of work, doesn't it? Right. Well, in fact, um, of the 13 years I was in the legislature, eight of them I served on the Education Committee, and I chaired the Education Committee uh, for a period of time when I was in the House of Representatives. So it was uh, a a natural uh, fit that when I went to the Muskie School, uh, we spent a lot of time looking at educational issues, Mm -hmm. but in particular I had the opportunity to work on a food security project uh, for Cumberland County. And that really um, uh, kind of highlighted my interest uh, for food because uh, one of the things I found out that I didn't know in the many years I spent in the legislature, uh, in 2010, uh, the state of Maine ranked second in uh, hunger. Mm-hmm. And uh, many people look at Maine, they think uh, we have a lot of forests, we have a lot of open space, and that we'd be able to supply uh, food for people uh, that live in the state. But, in fact, we've always ranked very high on both uh, indexes for food insecurity Mm -hmm. and for hunger. Yeah, Um, I I was really surprised to hear that because I'm such a foodie myself, and I think of Portland as a fabulously food-obsessed city. So, yeah, that came as a surprise. Well, and I've mentioned a number of times, um, we import about 80 to 85 percent of our food Mm -hmm. uh, from outside the state, and we're similar to New Hampshire and Vermont in that respect. And one of the things that struck me when I became mayor is how many restaurants we have in the city, but how reliant we are on importing food from uh, other parts of the country. Mm -hmm. So uh, this task force that I established when we started to focus uh, on on healthy food was really looking at how we could support the local economy, how we could support local farmers, how we could look at um, uh, keeping more dollars within the state of Maine and at the same time promote uh, healthy options for people uh, within the school and within the city. Right, and you, you referred to the task force. This is something you started when you began as mayor, is that right? That's correct. It was right. two and a half years ago, and it's called the uh, Mayor's Initiative on Healthy and Sustainable Food. Right. I'm interested in your use of the word imported. Um, uh-huh. you know, you, I know Portland Public Schools defines local as falling within a 300-mile right. radius. So when you say imported, you're really talking about food coming from outside that radius, right? That's right. That's right. And, you know, we, uh, when something happens in the food <laughs> chain nationally, the ripple effect of Maine, uh, you know, can be profound. Mm-hmm. And one of the things, obviously, that we do have uh, uh, some control over is purchasing practices uh, within uh, the Portland school system. And we are also the only city in the state that uh, runs a nursing home. Mm-hmm. So we set 
down and started to think about um, how are there ways that we could uh, get more healthy and local food into our school system and into other institutional settings within the city. Mm-hmm. So, um, I, again, so 85% imported, um, mm-hmm. that's huge. Um, so given that, I want to talk about the 50% local yeah. procurement goal. I mean, that's really high. So yes. why did you set it that high? Um and, well, I guess, yeah, the, the question is, why, for starters? <laughs> well, uh, part is because we thought it was doable. And mm-hmm. um, in talking to Ron Adams, we established a subcommittee uh, to look at this issue and to look at strategies that we might be able to develop uh, to get us to 50%. We were fortunate that a local foundation, the Gorman Foundation, gave us a $20,000 grant a year ago to do a marketing study. Mm-hmm to determine um, why people do buy uh, school lunch or they don't buy school lunch. And uh, we determined that if we could get 15% of students who currently are not buying lunch to buy their lunch, Mm -hmm. we could get to 50% and not have to expend any additional tax dollars. I think that's really interesting. we're struggling a little bit with that, um, as Mm -hmm. people are nationally with the new uh, uh, food regulations Mm -hmm. and new nutritional uh, regulations nationally. And we're really stepping back a little bit and looking at our marketing efforts again, and we're hopeful that in September we'll have a renewed effort uh, to get to that fifteen, that additional fifteen percent. Right. It, it, it's interesting that you've you've really nailed it. You know exactly what percentage you need to bump it up to, and I'm I'm um, excited to talk to Ron um, also after station break about yeah. those marketing efforts that you referred to. Um, was I right in saying that that this fifty percent local procurement goal was part of your political agenda from the get go? Well, the 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 task force was, and early on in the uh, discussion within the task force, we started to look at uh, what we could do Mm -hmm. uh, to make the schools more responsive to the local economy and having healthy food. And so it was a collective effort uh, of the group with Ron Adams, with the school personnel, and with people in the community that we came up with 50%. And right now we're we're hovering between 35 and 40%. Mm -hmm. Um, That does include milk in that equation, Mm -hmm. and that boosts it up a bit. But uh, my understanding, and you can talk to Ron, but at this point, we have more pounds of local um, food in our school system than the city of Boston. Uh, which is amazing, uh, g- right. given, given how much bigger Boston is. Right. So, um, so um, you know, Ron is going to tell us how difficult it's going to be for, to reach right. the goal. But, but you know, it, it really must help him and his department that the mayor is personally involved. I've seen a lot of right. pictures of you eating with school children. Do you, do you go into schools and, and do that a lot? Absolutely. Mm -hmm. Um, I just went out to uh, elementary school and had lunch with a group of uh, first graders who were in a Spanish immersion program, Mm -hmm. and they all counted to 50 to me in Spanish. Um, I just went over to Daring High School and had uh, lunch with uh, students who were at uh, Daring High School. And um, so every opportunity I have uh, to go speak with people in the community as well as uh, to go in the schools and encourage uh, them to uh, purchase uh, their their lunch there or, or food within the school, mm-hmm. um, I try to do that. Right, and that's called the Choose School Lunch Program. Right. You know, and on our last episode, we spoke with a former superintendent who was in the habit of frequently dining with the children. I've never heard of a mayor who does it. You know, I'm in New York, and I wish our mayor and our legislators would go eat school lunch with the kids. Well, well, as you know, I mean, there are a lot of goals that are achieved simultaneously by doing this. One is that the more self-sufficient, more sustainable uh, we are in Portland, that contributes to the local economy. Because we import so much local food, um, if we can reduce that, it helps with the carbon footprint in terms of reducing uh, transportation uh, into the city. Mm-hmm. And then lastly, it's just um, good policy uh, for students to be eating more healthy food. Of course. So um, the win win on this is uh, pretty profound, both from an economic, from a social, and from a a health uh, perspective. Mm -hmm. So, well, the schools are obviously your biggest institutional food purchaser, so that's, you know, your biggest push, but you're involved in other institutions as well. Well, we just had a a really exciting meeting um, uh, three weeks ago. Um, As you know, the ground fish industry in New England has suffered uh, from quotas and a number of other Mm -hmm. regulatory uh, practices. So now we're looking at uh, fish that is plentiful, hake, uh, redfish, dogfish, mm-hmm. and we're looking at ways that institutions such as Maine Medical Center, the University of New England, Maine um, uh, University of Southern Maine, um, and uh, Maine College of Art, as well as the Portland School System, mm-hmm. uh, can purchase uh, f- uh, fish that is available. So Ron just recently bought 400 pounds of hake mm-hmm. and turned them 
into, I think, uh, fish tacos for students in the Portland school system. Right. So uh, my, my hope is that uh, one day uh, soon we'll be able to have Lobster Day within the Portland school system and ooh, 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 give everybody amazing. a lobster roll. <laughs> They're doing that in Alaska. It'd be great if they could do it in Maine, too. That, right. that would be awesome. So, so you're a, a big proponent, not just of local, but hyper-local urban food production. Um, and this isn't right. about school food per se, but it, it relates, you know, as it uh, impacts families' experience well, of food. T- tell us what you're, you're doing in town. Well, the other thing that we've been committed to, we had about 150 people in Portland that um, uh, were on waiting lists to be part of a community garden, to have a plot in the community garden. And we've just uh, secured money from a private foundation to expand two uh, community gardens uh, within the city to allow people um, uh, to uh, have more opportunity to have their own plot. Mm -hmm. Uh, We're looking at permaculture and ways that uh, people can grow vegetables and food uh, in their backyard. Mm -hmm. Um, And we've also uh, had a proposal. We're just looking for a goat or sheep herd uh, that we can um, get in the city that will help us out a little bit with the mowing. (laughs) I love that. Um, And and, um, tell us about the orchard and the you have a berry grove, too. Uh, th- thank you. Uh, mm-hmm. Last uh, uh, fall, we planted um, uh, 45 uh, apple trees at the East End School in Portland and mm-hmm. created the East End Apple Orchard. Mm-hmm. And we've planted uh, peach trees, chestnut trees, um, and other fruit trees throughout the city. And um, we've had a tremendous response from both citizens and from uh, local businesses and other people uh, that are just very excited about the fact uh, that they're seeing apple trees and other fruit-producing uh, trees throughout the city. And, and this is fruit that is just publicly available. You can stroll through the park yes. and pick an apple off a tree. Right. Yeah, that, that's a beautiful idea and something, you know, in traveling in Central Europe years ago, I remember that they're just, you know, our traditional plum orchards around old monasteries. You can stroll through and pick fruit. So it's yeah. not a new idea, uh, but it may be a new idea for American cities. Yeah. Um, and, and, Laura, if I can just mention two other things very quickly. One is that we're also, uh, because we have so many restaurants in the city of Portland, um, we also are looking at permitting issues, we're mm-hmm. looking at business development issues, and we're looking uh, to better understand the food uh, industry in Portland from both uh, a processing as well as uh, 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 the commercial side. Mm-hmm. Um, and, and so we're at City Hall, we're trying to be more responsive to restaurants and to food processors in terms of our permitting practices and, and businesses practice, business practice. And then the other thing is that we continue to remain focused on food security issues. We mm-hmm. want to make Make sure um, that while people recognize we have some of the best restaurants in the United States, that we're also making a commitment uh, to make sure that um, uh, every child, every family uh, has an adequate uh, supply of food. Right, because hunger is an issue within Portland, as it is. That, in that is right. correct. Mm-hmm. We have the largest uh, homeless population mm-hmm. uh, in, in the state of Maine, and there we have 55% of the students in our school system qualify for free and reduced lunch. Right, right. Um, well, I, I wish you luck with all of this. It's truly inspirational. And um, I, I'm really sure, I know you haven't found that goat herd yet, but I'm so sure you'll <laughs> you'll find someone who like will, will think that's his or her dream job. So, <laughs> well, well, we're hopeful this summer that, that uh, we'll, we'll, we'll finally see that. Yeah. Okay, great. But, but in the meantime, we'll continue to plant fruit trees and to get more local products into our school system. Well, best of luck. Um, we have been speaking with Mayor Michael Brennan of Portland, Maine, about his city's practical approach to a set of very idealistic food goals um, for its schools and beyond. Uh, mayor Brennan, it's been such an honor. Thank you well, so thank much you. for joining us today. I, I, I'm honored to be the first mayor on your program. <laughs> okay. Um, you're listening to Inside School Food. Next up is Ron Adams, Director of Nutrition for Portland Public Schools, who will tell us what's local for lunch and what his department is doing to get kids to partake. Today's program is brought to you by Kane Vineyard and Winery, a Napa Valley winery committed to respecting the soil and dedicated to the creation of three Cabernet blends. This is Chris Howell from Kane Vineyard and Winery, calling in from Spring Mountain above the Napa Valley. Thank you for listening to this show. In our industrial world of highly processed food and wine, we support the values of Heritage Radio Network. All of us at Kane encourage you to seek out individuality and beauty in everything you eat and drink. To learn more about us, go to Kane5.com. 
This is Inside School Food. Today's conversation is about Portland, Maine public schools, really out there, really inspirational local uh, food procurement goal, 50% by the end of next year. I first heard about this in a presentation at the Farm to um, Institution New England Summit, um, and that was by Director of Nutrition Services, Ron Adam, and his Food Corps service member, um, Israel Bafardi. And the two of them attracted a really big crowd, um, not surprisingly. Um, Ron Adams is in his seventh year in Portland. In 2013, he led the opening of a new central kitchen and a major shift to a system involving a good deal of scratch cooking of meals that are cold shipped and reheated on site. Um, He currently serves a student body of about 7,000, which is the largest in Maine, um, and as Mayor Brennan said, with a free reduced rate of 52%. Good morning, Ron. Good morning, Laura. Thanks for having us on. Oh, our pleasure. Um, I'd like to start off by helping listeners kind of visualize um, you, you know, what you're doing locally. Uh, maybe we can use uh, the slide that you and Israel shared at the summit. It shows two of your nearly all local, or maybe they're completely local, lunches. Um, do you remember the slide, or should I read off what was on there? One of them no, is... If you could read it off, that'd be great. Okay, great. Okay, good. So the first one had a roasted chicken drumstick, um, something called honey roasted kale, a lentil salad, and a whole wheat roll. And the second one was a pesto and marinara pizza, corn on the cob, um, a biscuit made with local berries, and something called cocktail tomatoes, which is which are like ping pong sized tomatoes. Correct. So, and I and I remember that you talked about the backstory to every element on the plate. And I guess we don't probably don't have time to do all of that. But I wonder maybe like let's start with the. There's an interesting story behind the the chicken, which is local. How do you, how do you come to have that? Right. We um, that actually was one of the offshoots of. From the mayor's subcommittee. I mean, it, it's nice to have a, a group of people around the table talking about local food and how it can impact the city. And uh, one of the, you know, uh, up and coming bakeries in the area expanding into restaurants was like, hey, have you ever tried so and so's chicken? And I'm mm-hmm. like, no, I hadn't. So, you know, he, they made the connection, but it's, um, you know, he's selling more, um, you know, home raised uh, USDA processed chicken. Mm-hmm for boneless chicken breasts than he can handle, mm-hmm. but what he has a lot of are chicken wings and chicken drumsticks, right. and that's exactly what I need for my market. It's the right size. It comes in at the right price, and um, it was just a very fortunate matchup, and um, th- so that's worked very well for us. Um, you know, it's uh, got us into buying proteins locally, which, you know, we were worried about being able mm-hmm. to afford all the time, yeah. and so what we really tackled was, you know, going to uh, the Farm Fresh uh, lunches on Friday. So Farm right. Fresh Friday is, you know, our ma- our mantra this year, and uh, the the chicken's one of those big pieces. So yeah, it's, uh, it's it's great when when a school district can make an arrangement with a with a local chicken producer like that. And I understand this is sustainably raised chicken. There's no antibiotics involved. Yes, and that's and fabulous. that's the nice part. The right. only thing we can't say is we can't say it's halal, which would be a, another bonus in my uh, territory. Right. But um, you know, we're using uh, oyster cracker crumbs that are made in Rutland, Vermont, by mm-hmm. Westminster, and uh, it just gives it kind of like a panko coating. Mm-hmm. Coating, and we're able to uh, you know roast those off in our combi oven, uh, send them out into uh, the school to be reheated on site, um, and that that's turned into a, a, a very nice um, entree for us. They, they look delicious, and then. I noticed you have all of this corn, and there's, there's an, I mean, you can't have your staff sh- um, husk a whole bunch of corn for like 5,500 meals or however many you're doing. Um, right. How, how did you pull that off? Well, you know, uh, 12 years ago when we started doing local food, you know, in another district, uh, I was driving out to the farmers to pick up six bags of, you know, corn in the in the shucks and everything. Mm-hmm. So uh, w- what we do now is, you know, it's I, I buy 1,500 years of corn at a pop. Mm-hmm. Will serve one day, so it's about three thousand meals. So mm-hmm. I just set up with the elementary schools across the district. You know, we'd have the mayor in, we'd have the superintendent, we'd have you know uh, deputy superintendents. They would come out and shuck corn corn with the kids. So um, <laughs> it's, wait, uh, so, so the mayor was like working on the corn alongside the kids. Yeah, we, yeah so cool. we, we've had yeah. everybody that we, we can, be, and that's probably the next iteration is going to be the celebrity <laughs> corn chucking contest, so the second graders against the mayor or something like that. Oh, so, that's great. That's great. Um, but it is. It's a chance to really talk to kids about, uh, you know, what why farm to school and local food is important to them. Mm-hmm. Uh, you get to talk about, uh, you know, any of the 90, 99 
fun facts about corn on the cob, and everybody likes it. You know, it's something everybody's interested in, and there's corn silk across the city for the couple days that we do this. <laughs> and I, I guess if the kids, you know, husk the corn, they're going to eat the corn. We, we know this, so that that's cool, too. Um, you know, your, your pictures, these both of the meals in, in that slide that you guys shared at the conference, um, they, they make local look easy, and they make it look really delicious. And and I think, and as the mayor mentioned, you know, some things are easy, like local milk is, is not a problem, but... Um, you know, other items are not in such easy reach. I mean, of of the things that you're serving that are local, what what is an easier reach, and what are things are hard? You know, what things are harder for you to source within 300 miles? Um, it depends. Well, in Maine, it always depends on the time of the year. Mm-hmm. So, uh, you know, obviously, dairy I think is easy for everybody. Mm-hmm. Most of the times, it's going to be within that kind of mileage figure that we set. And uh, but as you start to go through the year, September is very easy because you know we have all the greens, we have the cucumbers and tomatoes and things like that. Mm-hmm. Um, you know, the late berries. Uh, corn on the cob is, is a big hit at that time of the year. Um, and then as you start to work through the rest of the season, though, it, it does get tougher. Um, and that's really what we found in our really the second year of really making a big push for local in Portland was that fruits and vegetables will only get you so far. You'll never get to 50 percent if that's mm-hmm. all you're buying. Mm-hmm. Um, you know, our, our average cost is probably under a dollar a pound for local fruits and, you know, fruits and vegetables. Right, right. When you, and uh, so we had to really start looking at what, how could you do it for protein. And that was, you know, it was a longer process. And uh, so things like the chicken came up. Uh, We've been playing back and forth with fish. We've had good years with fish. We've had, you know, hard times to find fish. Mm -hmm. Um, And this past year we moved to, um, or the last two years, we've been doing a uh, local beef um, outfit in in the middle of Maine. Mm -hmm. And uh, they were able to provide ground beef and, uh, you know, shaved steak that we use in steak sandwiches. Yeah, that, that's pretty exciting. I, I you know, it's, it, I, th- I think of Maine as a, you know, a source in the Northeast uh, for sustainable beef and, and ground beef. So um, it's nice that it's able to flow into the schools. Right. And, uh, and also being able to bring it in, you know, with the uh, proper USDA testing mm-hmm. and grading and everything along that line helps me on the food safety end as well. Right, right. So in, in getting local growers on board, you relied heavily on geographic preference. You, you actually assigned nine points for local and that, that struck me as unusually high. Um, did, it, did it work? I think it did. I mean, you remember, we used geographic preference in the uh, prime vendor bid, which mm-hmm. was actually, you know, probably within a month or two of the uh, the clause coming out from USDA. We, we plugged it right in uh, with some, some help through a grant. Mm-hmm. And uh, But you're, really what it did was it really showed our uh, dedication that we wanted and we were interested in local foods. Mm-hmm. And uh, what it really helped spur was that um, since that time, you know, four years ago, more and more vendors in Maine are bringing local foods and really highlighting what they're doing with it. So what we set up, and we we're very upfront in the bid situation, was that you know we're going to be marching 30 to 50 percent of our food being bought purchased through local vendors. Mm -hmm. If you can find those vendors and bring them to us, you'll keep the business. If you can't, I'm going to take my business elsewhere. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. So it was really the hammer and the hammer approach. There was no carrot here. (laughs) You know, it it was, uh, we were interested in it severe, you know, seriously. And and this is what it'll do if you, if you keep our business. And, you know, um, the vendor has not, you know, um, our winning vendor was able to bring in a lot of, a lot of things uh, recently. And they've been able to keep that bid with that, with that nine points, but Mm -hmm. it's really spurred a a change in suppliers across the area. Right. But it does mean that um, because there's so many points assigned to local that your your price for local, you you said um, at the at the in your presentation at the summit that your local meals are averaging a dollar fifty for food, whereas your less local or non local ones are one twenty five. Right, right, yeah. and and that's the thing, and that's why we chose. We tried to have a bigger impact by concentrating the the Farm Fresh Friday mm-hmm. with you know some promotion and uh, marketing, and to really make that work. So we're trying to keep our um, entrees at about seventy five cents at the most, mm-hmm. and you can't do that five days of the week. There's right, right, just right. no way to do that. Yeah, and I, as I said earlier, I think we should be clear that you're one of those lucky districts with a large scale production kitchen equipped with you've got goodies like eighty gallon kettles, combi ovens, that's tilt skillets. Um, peeling and packing machines and even a conveyor belt dishwasher. So that helps you, you know, having that facility to cook can help you keep the cost down, I'm sure. 
Correct, and, yeah. and it was, and that and that was again that was an investment by the city. You know, mm-hmm. we we went out and uh, you know worked on the city for probably a year and a half, mm-hmm. and then got a three million dollar bond mm-hmm. to uh, to renovate a, a newer facility so that we could get that new equipment and bring it online. Right. And uh, and that's the thing is, you know, if you do scratch cooking, you can afford to put more into the equipment and more into the food. Right, and so that that brings up a really interesting project that you are doing in collaboration. Was was it is it the Good Good Shepherd Food Pantry? Yep, the Good Shepherd Food Bank. A, and a food bank, yeah. Group. yeah. So you're, you're, you have like a barter arrangement which uses your sophisticated um, kitchen setup. T- tell us what you're doing with them. Um, so what I saw was that I, you know, if we produce all of our own uh, spaghetti sauce for the year, we would need about forty thousand pounds of tomatoes, mm-hmm. uh, local tomatoes. And I was, well, that's not in my, you know, my technical area of expertise. So uh, the people who do things like that are the Good Shepherd Food Bank. So mm-hmm. they're purchasing about a million pounds a year uh, from for the to stock food pantries with local fresh fruits and vegetables. Mm-hmm. So um, when we talked with them, they they were looking at well. Well, we could find you the tomatoes, but we could really use spaghetti sauce back if there's any way we could do that. Mm-hmm. So essentially, they donate tomatoes to us. We produce, use my labor to produce spaghetti sauce. So, uh, you know, half, half the 8,000 pounds of tomatoes they donated to us this year will send back as uh, spaghetti sauce so they can use that in their uh, congregate feeding operations around southern Maine. That's very creative. And that, and that marinara on the pizza that we just talked about, that's, that's that part of that project, right? Right, right, yeah. and and so we're kind of using that red sauce as a base for everything, from the taco to uh, sloppy joes and pasta and meatballs. So um, yeah. it, it's a very versatile product. Red sauce seems to go fairly well for everything, and Mainers can grow tomatoes. There's there's no issue there. They certainly can. I, they're on sale at Whole Foods here in New York City for a lot of money. So you know that's very right. good. Um, so now I want to talk about the toughest part of your story. You know, listeners who know Portland as this deeply foodie, passionately locavore city may be surprised to learn that so many of your full-pay families aren't always excited to sign their kids up for your beautiful locavore meals. Like, what's what's the issue? Well, I, you know, I, I think you're always you're always going to work against history, which is when they were in school, the, the meals probably didn't look that good. Mm-hmm. And uh, so it's a lot. What we found is we can make all the changes we want back of the house and on the menus, but unless you can get out there and market to parents and tell them what's different, um, you know, that, that's, a, that's a big thing because everybody's going to revert to what they remember. Mm-hmm. And, um, and really what we saw is that, uh, you know, when I got here seven years ago, participation was anywhere from anywhere between 35 to 40 percent. Mm-hmm. And, uh, you know, we're now, we've been as high as 53%. We've kind of slid back in the last year or two. Mm-hmm. And um, and that's just part of the, the hard school of hard knocks. Uh, paid families have not been very, uh, you know, highly participant um, group. It can be as low as, you know, as low as 10% at a high school where we have open campuses. You can always walk across the street to the uh, food court and mm-hmm. things like that. So there are a lot of challenges we have along that line. But um, I, I think a lot of it is just being able to tell parents and, and make sure they see those photos. So that's kind of the outreach we started this year with uh, Israel being our food on as food court member. Yeah, and, and he's doing an amazing job. He, um, he passed out copies of parent surveys that he is um, circulating, and he said that he sends them out and then he sends them out again. Um, right. Yeah, yeah. And then, and then um, you also have like a program of you know eat with your kids days. You're inviting parents in to check it out. Right, right. Mm-hmm. So that that's kind of what we're trying to do for the outreach and just really being able to get out more to PTO meetings and, and really engage parents. Um, sometimes it's tough when uh, you know if the district office wants to talk about you know is your is your kid happy in schools? Mm-hmm. It's you know I'm competing for how many times you can survey parents. So right. there there are a lot of interactions you got to watch. Right. So and you got a grant. I think it was last year to do this really wild um, kind of expo, a local food showcase off school grounds. Can you can you tell us about that? Right. So that was through the USDA Farm to School Implementation Grant. Mm-hmm. And uh, so we had a pretty much the capstone event was to bring uh, we about 500 students right down on the waterfront where we have a beautiful uh, city facility that they donated to us for the day. And uh, so we lined up 10 different um, opportunities. 10 different tasting tables. One had the farmer that grew the food, and then the next was the uh, uh, dietary student who was able to let them taste the food and, and mm-hmm. count what the votes were, whether yeah. they liked it, it was okay, or they didn't like it yeah. that day. Yeah. So 
it was a great opportunity for students to come hear a story behind the food and then taste the food that we were producing. Yeah, it was a beautiful thing. I, I hope you can get a grant to do it again because it's was, <laughs> just looked yeah. like it could yeah. really help bump up your participation. Um, no, no, we we didn't really talk about the um, students who are who are non pay. I, I know that you have um, a different set of challenges with in serving students from with uh, immigrant families. Um, and when when one thinks Portland and Maine, do, one doesn't think about um, these populations. But indeed, you've got people from all over the world living there with special dietary concerns. What's what's involved in serving them? Um, yeah, Portland High School has over 50 languages, mm-hmm. and uh, we're a refugee city, and um, so we have a lot of new families coming in all the time throughout the school year, and uh, that definitely can be a challenge. So uh, what we really do is we try and uh, make sure the menu is always out there and ready to, you know, able to be translated. We've got community translators so they can touch base with folks. So when we produce, you know, promote summer feeding, they're able to get that into their communities. Mm-hmm. Um, you know, in the elementary level, we we do the most change, which is, you know, we're pretty much not using pork products at all, Mm -hmm. uh, except for the ham Italians that are tradition around here once a month. Um, We're always trying, we always make sure there's a non-meat alternative Mm -hmm. meal. Mm -hmm. So that could be something as easy as sun butter and jelly, but we also do uh, bento boxes. So it's like cheese cubes and roasted sunflower seeds. Uh, We do edamame. We also do a black bean salsa and nacho cheese dip. So those are, we're certain to always have something that's a non-meat because sometimes even uh, kids are not familiar. If they see a hamburger, they say, well, there's ham in it because it's a hamburger, right, obviously. Right. Uh, so those are some of the perceptions you have to work around and, and be careful how you word things in menus. Of course, of course, because you've got a lot of kids from um, um, Islamic communities in West Africa and North Africa. Is that what you told me? Correct, correct. Yeah, yeah, and, you know, a lot of Iraqis in, the, in this past year mm-hmm. as well. So uh, mm-hmm. it, you just try and be sensitive to what's going on and, and try and get more and more into the community. But, it, again, it goes back to your basic marketing of here's, what's, here's what it's about in food in right. the school. Right. So, Ron, 2016 is right around the corner. Do you, do you really think you're going to make the 50% goal in time? Um at our current trajectory, no, I don't think we're going to make it on time. I think we're we're probably going to have to invest some more in marketing, right. um, and really we'll probably push back one, if not two, years to try and make that fifty percent. But still, I think uh, we've exta- we've established you know the benchmarks of where we need to go. You know, I probably overspent some on protein this year, so mm-hmm. we'll put some more back into vegetables next year and uh, just continue on our track. But you know, again, it's over probably the last five years that we've really gone from. Uh, zero to 35 percent. It's just really impressive. You know, and, and when Mayor Brandon says, well, we only need to bring it up by 15 percent, I think people who are not working inside school food may think, oh, that's no big deal. You know, build it and they right. will come. But, you know, right. if only, right? <laughs> kids, well, kids will be yeah, kids. Yeah. And that's the big piece of it is that, you know, you get the 60 percent of all the all kids participating, then, you know, we're at break-even status and I can spend money where I need to spend money. And, mm-hmm. and that was really the goal where he's talking. So, right. so I'm trying to get my three percent participation of paid students to 15 percent for yeah. paid students and, yeah. and that's a tough road to go sometimes sure well i am rooting for you and i'm sure our listeners are too um you're already close enough to 50 percent to be something of a beacon to other districts committed to farm to school I, I mean especially given that you're in maine so um thank you so much for telling us about it today Oh, you're welcome. Thanks for uh, featuring us. So you have been listening to Ron Adams of Portland, Maine Public Schools. And as always, we have resources connected with today's episode on InsideSchoolFood.com. All Inside School episodes are also archived at HeritageRadioNetwork.org and iTunes and Stitcher if you want to upload podcasts to your mobile device. Um, And everyone, please remember to tell us who you are. Our sponsors need to know who's listening. And of course, we need to know so we can deliver the content that you want and need. Um, And to the many listeners who have joined us via Twitter, Facebook, or the Inside School Food newsletter, thank you. Um, It may seem like a small thing, but believe me, it helps a lot. Um, I am Laura Stanley, producer for and proud member supporter of the Heritage Radio Network. Um, Inside School Food will be on break for Memorial Day next week, so we'll see you again on Monday, June the 1st. Thanks for listening to this program on heritageradionetwork.org. You can find all of our archived programs on our website or as podcasts in the iTunes store by searching Heritage Radio Network. 
You can like us on Facebook and follow us on Twitter at Heritage underscore radio. You can email us with questions anytime at info at heritageradionetwork.org. Heritage Radio Network is a 501c3 nonprofit. To donate and become a member, visit our website today. Thanks for listening. We don't play for money. Hey, listeners, we're nearing the end of our 15th anniversary fundraising campaign, and we need your help to meet our goal. This campaign offers you a chance to win a unique food and music experience in one of the most exciting cities in America. Here's how it works. Donate to HRN and you'll be entered to win dinner for two and two tickets to a concert in one of eight amazing cities. New York, Los Angeles, Philadelphia, Nashville, Las Vegas, Charleston, Ardmore, Pennsylvania, and Asheville. All donations support our work educating food system storytellers. And when you donate, you can choose one of those cities and you'll be entered to win dinner and two tickets to a show. So help us reach our goal and enter to win dinner and a show in the city of your choice. Check out heritageradionetwork.org 15 to donate and enter to win today. That's heritageradionetwork.org 15. Thank you.